Well, today's talk is on um, Sydney Future Infrastructure Challenge, investigating world's best practice to create sustainable geotechnic, geotechnical database for New South Wales. You know, based on all the work we're doing, um, we need to uh, have an approach for the future. Okay, um, today I'll sort of the talk will be broken up into um, three parts. Um, yeah, the part that's already been done, so the tunneling been done on Sydney Southwest, um, and where I'll talk about Sydney Harbour and Central. Um, and also I'll talk, touch on about Sydney Metro West, which is just going out for expression of interest. And um, I'll highlight some of the things that we've discovered along the way during that investigation and compiling everything together. And Churchill Fellowship, uh, last year I was awarded Churchill Fellow um, to go and assess across different geological surveys internationally. That's been put on hold due to COVID-19. And um, so that's to go out and research how other geological surveys um, compile all their data and, um, and then use it later um, for the benefit of the for, for society. All right, Sydney Metro, City in Southwest. Um, this was started in 2014. We um, undertook geophysics. Um, um, we're able to, based on the geophysics, we're able to plan our investigations um, across the harbour. So this entailed, you know, the the, um, the set out here on the on the harbour, HQ coring, sonic coring, in situ stress testing, water pressure testing, and a series of geophysics um, on land. Um, 197. Um, boreholes um, were done, including a whole lot of testing that went under, um, went right through that whole process. And you can see the constraints we had out on the harbour, setting up barges on the harbour, and also drilling at Central um, Platform 15 there, um, yeah, close to um, live rail systems. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, just, these are just highlights of um, what I've captured. Um, you know, some of the processes that we undertook earlier on in the piece. Um, we, we, we undertook um, marine mag, um, that's that sort of coloured um, show across here from Sydney Harbour, just to assess whether we had any um, still, you know, still, you know, still items in the harbour or whether um, yeah, if we could pick up these, um, these dikes that were published in 1983 geological map. Um, so no, um, it was really, we didn't pick up anything that sort of, but yeah, the Lunar Park Fault Zone does highlight um, a bit with the, with the mag across, across the harbour, and that could be just something else, I don't know. Um, um, the other survey is just a typical um, reflection survey that was done um, across the harbour. Uh, okay. All right, so based on all the work uh, that was done out there, um, you know, bathymetrics, you know, um, you know, detailed seismic reflection. Yeah, we also did cross-hole tomography to chase um, um, what the, the deepening of the harbour and from that we actually uncovered a, what appears to be a major geological structure, a low angle flush fault and um, I can talk about that maybe a bit later. And then the later additional refraction surveys across the harbour and, um, yeah, and some resistivity surveys that we undertook as well. Um, yeah, based on the, the yeah, compiling the geophysics, um, um, we were able to, with the boreholes, further constrain our knowledge of the top of rock surface. So you can see the projected surface below the sediments. Um, so with the surface, yeah, the green highlights, you know, silty, silty clays, um, yellow sort of highlight sands, um, and the blues um, are, uh, yeah, um, other silty clays and then into, into more fluvial and colluvial material, which are the red 
zones um, to the to the north. And again, looking to the south, you can see the two tunnels running through, and um, yeah, the profile through the harbour there. Um, so you're yeah, building up these three D models. Um, yeah, this yeah this yeah this is what I'll put together for yeah an understanding of later. Um, so sections through the harbour, um, just a profile um, highlighting the the job, the the um, section of those layers that were modelled in three D, and um, you can highlight those areas there between the yeah, the unit one that we classified, unit two are the sands, silty clays are the green, um, sort of sandy. Um, clay type material and then you get this sort of colluvial material with big boulders that um, had fallen down um, and you can see the red line that runs across with the green box that defines um, where the tunnel boring machine went across Sydney Harbour um, so two, two times. Um, part of the work we did was to um, assess geological structure on land because um, it, the type of TBM at that time we hadn't um, decided and yeah, potentially we needed to understand what the structure was in the rock as well. So we sort of went regional um, and assessed the structures around the McMahon's Point Peninsula um, and we're able to map in the um, dikes based on some um, you know, evidence from retaining walls and, um, and joint sets that appear next to them. Um, so you can see the detailed sort of collection of data across that area as well. Um, so you can have a look at the overlying air photos. Um, so this is um, the structure map that we define. Um, but if you overlay the old 1983 geological map, um, you can see where the dikes were initially. Um, based on mapping, we, we believe that they are. And, Targeting investigation with boreholes, we did identify uh, the dike down here, but the one up here was just too constrained to get in there to do any drilling. So, so it was just it was put there as a knowledge that the tunnellers um, had to um, be aware of. So the crossing was done by um, tunnel boring machine. Uh, this was um, named Kathleen. Um, it's a specialist tunnel boring machine, um, slurry mix mode. So it sort of um, it sort of can tunnel through rock and 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 also sediment. Once it gets it's under full face pressure, and where we were, we we're probably under about four bar of pressure there. So it's sort of um, an interesting you know, an interesting concept of tunneling. Um, so the completed tunnels, so this is at Blues Point, the extraction point. So this was the completed two tunnels across Sydney Harbour. Um, and you can see as you run back through um, the rock there, they're all segmentally lined with um, fully encased concrete um, that uh, um, um, put, um, built, constructed as the, as the tunnel boring machine progresses forward. So, what we also did, we did some legacy work on, on the harbour as well. We did some carbon um, dates on the um, radio, yeah. And so we were able to do about, I think about nine. Um, and so we were able to do some profiling of the, of the sediments. Um, some of them down below are greater than 50,000 years, um, but some of them up around here, 38,000 years, and then the sands come in about 22,000 years. You can see the units across here on the left. And um, we've actually defined the, the Holocene, which um, came in at less than 10,000 year old. Um, so we've got two dates in this section over here and um, in several dates. And the, a lot of these had a whole lot of um, shells um, across the harbour. But as soon as you got into this material down below, um, there was no evidence of any shells um, which sort of indicated possibly a fluvial type um, environment. So just a, a river um, river line that was sort of progressed before sea levels rose. All right, the next one that was of interest was um, Central. A lot of you probably catch trains through Central and wonder what's going on. Um, but 
the earlier work we did there was um, quite significant trying to pull together, understand yeah, the cemeteries that we had there, old buildings, um, gas works, and, um, and plan all our investigations around this. So a lot of people that used to go to UTS um, would have walked down Devonshire Street here. And yeah, back in the old days, um, yeah, that was where the cemetery was on the, on the northern side. And you can see with the progression, you, you sort of went from 1900s, they cleared the cemetery um, and then um, and built the Grand Terminal here, the country line. And then in 20, 1924, the suburban lines were put in. Um, but in the later on, this is another um, excavation for the Eastern Suburbs Rail that was cut in Chalmers Street. So it's so a bit complex, the history around that area. So with all the information we collected, um, boreholes and that from, from Sydney trains and all that, we were able to, um, I was able to build up this 3D model across that area. Um, and you can see the, the different um, layers from Asheville Shale down to Hawkesbury Sandstone. Um, these are all Triassic sediments um, or sedimentary rocks. Um, and uh, the yellow up here are the Aeolian windblown sands that have come across from Botany and blown across and hence why there was a cemetery here um, because yeah they buried their buried everybody in the sands but the name from historical names was um, um, was actually called last Sandy Hills this central area before it was cleared and um, the old stations put in now now we have this metro station that's being constructed here and you can see the dike the dike is an outer and yeah, the southern margin and the northern margin, but it's up to six metres wide um, that progresses. Um, it was actually 1952, it was assessed by the Geological Survey at the Dental Hospital. And so that information that we get off, um, off the government website, BIGS, um, was used to um, build, the, build this model up across Sydney. Um, and you can see the inclined boreholes that were put, put across to target these dikes. But also the dike that runs along Eddy Avenue, um, that was picked up in um, tunnel mapping from the Eastern Suburbs rail line. And so using that information there, we're able to um, um, target this borehole across here and intersect the dike in that location. So it sort of gives us some precision. And yeah, this is a typical section through um, through um, Central Station. Um, you can see the dikes, these big tabular discordant and bodies, um, and uh, the upper Aeolian sands, and then residual capping, and you know, the sort of Mittagong um, formation here um, sits just above. And as you progress to the east, you get into the Asheville Shale. And what's interesting about this location and what we, that structure we found on Sydney Harbour is, if, you, if, you, if you're up in North Sydney and you've got Asheville Shale, it sits at an RL of about 80 metres and down here you're at, at an RL of about 20 metres. So there's, there's a difference in, um, in, in, in elevation of you know, 50, 60 metres and, um, you know, and these, you know, it sort of indicates that there's been some sort of um, some geological processes that have elevated the rock to the north from the south. So if you wonder the big cranes and platforms sitting at Central, this is what's happening below, big excavations that are happening. Um, I went down to inspect because um, I assessed the, geolog the big dike that's down there. And, and this is some of the core that we intersected here. The dike's pretty well um, highly weathered, which sort of compares to the rock here. And I suspect as you go further down, it'll get better, get a better material and it, in that outcrop it's up to six metres wide um, with sort of planar and irregular boundaries on it so it's an interesting um, view when I went down and it's sort of been termed the Ultimo dike which is pretty continuous you'll see on the next photos from Metro West. So Metro West um, this is the new project that's um, being put out the tender now. Um, in this one here was um, much of a data sharing approach. Um, so you can see the, the, the boreholes that we have across Sydney. A lot of these 
or yeah, 80% of them are all linked to boreholes and reports. So you can actually access locations. So the government department can access this information and use it internally for their own use now. So across the alignment from, from west to east, um, we used 130 historical boreholes. They range from 1800s. Um, but the big key ones were the old, all the old earlier projects, um, CBD Metro, you know, substantial amount of work that were done in those earlier projects 10 years ago. Um, yeah, these projects come to a halt, but um, we're able to capture this data and hold on to it. So. So across the Sydney region, we have access to 13,000 um, boreholes, um, which are all attributed and um, yeah, they have reliability, they have ownership um, and all that sort of thing. So you know, you know, future use of this can be, you know, there's a whole lot of history in that, in that database. Uh, <clears throat> so with the GINT um, database, we're able to incorporate 480 of these boreholes into the GINT. In associ yeah, associated with the um, the new boreholes we've done. Um, so with paleo, so across this part of the work was to identify paleo valleys with a pretty significant faults, dikes, brick pits, um, and industri industrial areas, especially when we head west and brick pits, especially. So, so I can show you an example next. Oops. Um, here's a classic example out at um, St Peter's. Um, We've got a tunnel uh, that was placed below Sydney Park Road. Um, and uh, you can see the brick pits on either side of it um, there. So we, you know, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've highlighted this and um, you know, the contractors came in for detailed design, picked up a, a tunnel um, that went from one brick pit to another. And um, so a whole lot of further investigations were done to assess whether this was impacted on the tunnels below, but it was sort of found from one intersecting borehole here that uh, that was the void space for that sort of um, conveyor shaft there, which yeah, it was just a faint line on a map that was picked up from a library search. So the investigations, um, yeah, we did 92 um, boreholes across Sydney. Um, that was incorporated with in situ stress tests, water pressing down. Everyone was downhole image, so we can we can measure the geological structure in this, and um, potentially in three D modelling you can develop structures. Um, Sixty nine piezometers were put across the alignment to measure groundwater and temperatures in the ground, and um, and then twenty seven shallow um, boreholes to measure contamination and any perch groundwater. Um, and 32 CPTs were done in soft ground areas. Um, so yeah, some of the bay areas and um, um, river flat areas um, we've used 32. And we've got more planned for the future um, once, once the tenderers start assessing where they want to do more work. And across these areas, because there's a lot of industry, we've done a lot of um, environmental um, boreholes and monitoring wells to, to, um, to assess that. So over the harbour, um, yeah, we did you know, many, many bays. We did um, 13 boreholes across these um, harbours. Um, these included the same testing uh, that we did on, and yeah, a lot of sedimentological analysis. And on this one here, we did some more carbon age dating on, on sediments um, from Darling Harbour right through to, um, to Parramatta. Um, so, so yeah, we've sort of got an idea of um, of age of, um, of of sediments across these areas. And started off, we did a series of um, geophysics surveys across these regions here to uh, give us an idea of where where rock level is, so we could actually plan our um, investigations. Um, yeah, yeah. If we if we don't know where the investigations is, well, we can't we can't get these sort of projects priced up. So. So part of the desktop study, I did a sort of a, a borehole reliability map. It's sort of just contouring the reliance of the, of the data. Um, and um, so basically all the little blue dots are all the historical information there. And yeah, you just sort of contour up what we have. So scale 
One would be information that you know, have you know, coordinates, um, RLs, um, you know, you know, borehole photos, good logs, and then it progressively gets um, you know, um, to fall when, when, you, when you don't have good information. But doing this, um, we're able to plan where we were going to do boreholes um, based on some of the areas. The alignment changed um, from, from our early days, but um, you'll see the change in colour on the next um, slide. So once we did the boreholes, there was a significant shift um, that sort of gave us a, um, a bit more confidence in areas um, that yeah, we achieved what we had to achieve with the investigation. So with the bays area, um, across this area, you can see the boreholes through here. There was about 300 boreholes collected. Um, so we were able to model the um, top of Hawkesbury sandstone through this area um, and also um, define the, um, these dikes, the Great Sydney Dyke, which is a pretty significant dike that runs all the way back to the coast um, and the Ultimo Dyke over here, which is the one that I highlighted in its central. Um, we've also been able to model the, um, the alluvial material in the harbour um, as well. And you can see once you put the LIDAR on there, you can see where the bays are and there's sort of the, the elevated rock structure here that highlights the old Glebe Island. And this is where the um, Anzac Bridge sort of runs across here. So if we see the Great Sydney Dyke running through here, this is what it looks like in our crop just to the north of Anzac Bridge um, approach, six metre wide, um, and pretty significant dike that sort of cuts across Sydney. Um, at the moment now it's full of trees. So this picture taken uh, like yeah, 20 years ago, I think, um, you know, it's sort of, um, and what I've done is approach the government agencies to actually preserve this and not destroy this outcrop because it has significant, um, um, historical um, you know, for, for, for geology as a whole. All right, with Metro West, um, during Metro West, we, we noted, because um, um, we intersected um, Hawkesbury Sandstone all the way down um, in our investigations, um, we are able to understand, uh, I don't know what this thing up here, sorry, there's something that's cropped across my picture, sorry. Um, yeah, so, yeah, based on Northwest Metro, um, where we've had Asheville Shale um, and Metro West and, and City in Southwest, um, we're able to um, pull out boreholes that um, intersected Asheville Shale or good quality. Yeah. And based on this 108 boreholes, um, we're able to define this tuff flap lamination that is right across the Sydney area um, at, at a level of three metres above um, the top of the uh, Mittagong formation. So if you have a look here, just a uh, description, Hawkesbury sandstone, cross bedded, medium to coarse grain um, quartzo sandstone, and then into the Mittagong formation, which is um, Sort of variable from interbedded sandstones to um, um, you know, um, more siltstone interbedded you know, with sandstone interbeds, um, as we call laminites. The base of the um, um, Asheville Shale is defined by the, um, the Rouse Hill member, um, and that's this section here. It's about six metres in depth um, and um, about a metre down and three metres above, um, you've got the tuff layer here. So immediately above the asphalt shale, you've got the um, Kellyville laminites, which is the interbedded siltstones and sandstones. So with the boreholes across Sydney, Northwest Rail, um, you know, the geologists during that project there actually used this to um, define their um, um, any offsets for faults. Um, and so um, we progressed this work and yeah, we sit in Southwest, you can see out of Campsie, um, the borehole, no, Campsie is the one down here, um, but City Metro West, this is out at, um, at a Parramatta, or, or at Sydney Olympic Park, I think. Um, you can see the tuff layer in the core here, and these all sit 
exactly the same distance as these. Um, so it's about 2.97 metres plus or minus 400 mil. And this is right across um, Sydney. But what was interesting, we did some work down on the Southern Highlands and um, we picked up the Asheville Shale in that rock there. And um, again, the tuff layer was sitting, or the tuff lamination was sitting at that level above Hawkesbury Sandstone as well. So um, one of the samples that we got from Westmead, um, we actually sent across to the US um, and got some um, the extracted zircons, and we've come back with a date of um, 242 million years, um, which is pretty significant for um, um, understanding yeah, where they sit in the Triassic sequence. And again, um, so these are the boreholes where I've collected those samples, and so those horizons there, Hawkesbury at the bottom, Mittagong, and you can see the variability in thickness of the Mittagong. So it's really not a good marker system if you don't if if Hawkesbury sandstones there because it does get variably thick across the um, the region. Um, but the tuff uh, lamination, if you do pick it up, it does make a good little um, correlation tool across the um, and you can see the sort of structure that. So we're running east west here to um, to Rose Hill and that's sort of parallel to the. Um, the general you want that axis. Axis. and then um, as we as we head north we we're in a limb of a um, the 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 geology is rising to the north so it's a limb part of the um, the anti oh, syncline that the Fairfield syncline that's running through that area and then it flattens out again as we as we go east west again so this is the only thing um, but we we are picking up some significant structural um, um, movements across the, from Concord through to Rose Hill. And so this is an example, um, we're at Sydney Olympic Park here, um, Haslam's Creek crossing, and some of the boreholes that we did here, we um, define, yeah, based on that tuff layer and the, and the Hawkesbury sandstone, um, the tuff layer sort of gave us an indication that, yeah, we had a depressed zone in here and this is significant right across from Concord through to this area so what I believe is happening is we've got some form of Horst and Graben system that's formed the lowlands and you can see the 3D um, diagram here where you've got the elevated um, um, uh, zone yeah, these are where we built our Olympic stadiums and yeah, to the east or to the west we've got yeah, silver water where it's another elevated zone and as you go to Duck Creek it sort of drops off again. And what I see happening across these areas is um, if you go to the north, you can't pick up these. You, sometimes you'll just see some discrete geological structures to the north, but then you come into these bays here and it opens up, it's a zone of depression. So I believe we've got some significant um, um, structure happening in this area and it, yeah, possibly related to some sort of, um, yeah, yeah release bend or something like that so it's 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 interesting and then looking to the north here um you can see um elevated um areas here and the all the lowlands here and and you're isolated by these highlands and across it roads as well so and we have mapped the you know the homebush bay fault zone does run through this whole area here and it's picked up in a lot of boreholes as crush zones and then we picked up a big crush zone in, in one of the boreholes that Sydney Uni and Utrecht are um, collaborating um, with me on to assess, um, understand these structures in more detail. All right, Churchill Fellowship. Um, oh, yeah, I should have been over there now, but oh well, that's life. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, yeah, secure all the geology and geotechnical data to make a sustainable um, information data set for the future and um, you know you can see everything that we've done in the past and if we lose that it becomes an issue um, you know in the future you know, a lot of more money that's spent on that so at the present data sets that we've got for New South Wales we've got digs which is public online information system um, MinView um, which is an excellent mapping system you know with boreholes geology um, and now it's also brought in the 
geotech information from public works. And then also the core library, the geological, you know, the transport for New South Wales have been using the core library as a, as a repository for all their core. And um, this, this allows the um, contractors a, a better place to go and assess the core um, you know, to tender with. Other portals that we have are just um, um, office EPA, spatial services and uh, water New South Wales. Geoscience Australia has a, yeah, a data thing and um, transport for New South Wales across are uh, using a, um, a to do project data set that captures geological, geotech and utilities. Um, so everything that brings together from the project is captured within that data set. And so this should be um, put into like some sort of grand, grand dial before you dig and hence why I want to go to overseas to look at these things. So the create database is just my GIS system when it comes to geology is just um, transposed onto this. Um, so you can see the GF structures through here, dikes, faults and boreholes um, overlaid with the statewide seamless geology. Um, and yeah, you've got alignments, you've got designs, you've got everything in this one, one, um, one database here. The other database that's been so useful on these projects is, um, is DIGS. Um, and a classic example, I was trying to understand where these dikes are progressing across um, on the northern side of Sydney and um, what came in one of these reports here um, from DIGS from 1943. Um, and you can see um, HMAS, I think it's Waterhen, um, big excavation that runs here. But in this report here, it showed this big photograph of, um, of the rock face. So this was in the 1943 air photo. Um, because we were trying to chase the dikes across this area, um, well, there's no evidence of dikes in there. So that sort of limited um, where we had to look. So it's sort of, it, there's a lot of information that's captured in these sets and you know, people should use it. Um, MinView, um, another good set. Um, I use it all the time, you know, especially when uh, for boreholes, you know, trying to understand um, you know, you know, regional um, stratigraphy and that um, is pretty useful. And now with the, with the public works data set on there under geotech reports, um, you've got access to um, geotech information or just information general across an area. So it's quite, quite a good resource. So my assessment was supposed to be, um, um, yeah, part of it is to talk with industry, public sectors um, to um, identify any benefits um, with collaboration to um, bring all this data, all this data set together. Um, when I was with the GS survey, I initially carried out an audit on on um, a lot of the government departments, but this would like this would be this this need to be followed up again. Um, so as part of my church, I'll undertake this, um, and also consultation with industry, um, which is undergoing at the moment. Um, so there's um, the Geotechnical Society of Australia are um, you know, you know, being being brought into this as well, and part of my study was to um, you know to assess even Queensland geotechnical database um, journey to England to visit the British Geological Survey, Netherlands um, um, to visit the um, their geological survey and. Um, um, yeah, the Geological Survey of Japan and their 3D modelling and also visit Swiss Topo and the Swiss Geotech Society wanted um, basically were interested to um, um, get together and talk how because they're, they're keen on doing something what we want to do here too. So I'm just summarising what, what's um, happening over in the in these countries. Um, British Geological S Survey um, uh, undergoing uh, Project Iceberg, and this is a data framework that captures a lot of information. Um, where we have 2D here, uh, they're capturing it in a 3D sense, so tunnels, um, utilities, geotech, boreholes, everything's been captured, so it's um, 
quite an interesting concept and um, hope progress that's happening. But now what they're doing, um, you can see across um, the UK, um, they've access to a lot of boreholes, but the boreholes are standardized using a, a, um, an attributed table, um, which we use as um, an AGS industry standard um, that we work here with when we do geotech. But if, if you keep everything consistent, then um, the work is, um, um, can, can progress and be, um, become standard. But now what they're doing is exploiting these data sets. So British Geological Survey are developing um, Groundhog desktop application. And this, this information here, you can actually do build geological models from the, from the data sets that they've got on the, on the, on the system. And you can see here um, the exploitation of the data set, you know, um, adding information in and um, you know, profiling it and, and capturing it in a 3D. So, at the moment, they're developing this, so it's um, quite an exciting concept that they're happening. So the Netherlands Geological Survey of the Netherlands, or termed TNO, um, have, have developed a system called BRO. Um, so it's a key register that captures subsurface information. And basically, it's, um, yeah, they've implement, imp, implemented law that um, public has to um, subscribe to this database um, and register anything they do that um, when they break the ground. So it's sort of quite important um, to understand that you're capturing information and, and understand where people are putting boreholes because they can have impact um, in, in a city environment on, on tunnels or anything, especially in tunnel environment. If you've got voids um, above, they can be, they can put people's lives at risk. So it's quite, quite new. Yeah, and then they've also got Surface Viewer from their, from their 2D platform. Um, so they can generate profiles and 3D images from that. So it's um, exciting stuff they've got. Um, the Geological Survey of Japan, most of it's in Japanese. So um, it's hard to um, um, understand. That's why I'd like to go. Yeah, I really wanted to go there and assess what they were doing. Um, but again, they've got a, a menu type system where you can click on and um, open up um, your boreholes. Um, but also they've got, um, they've got provision for 3D maps and um, sections. So you can generate sections across these geological areas. So. And Swiss Topo um, is another one that um, are combining their geological resource together and, and developing 3D models. Um, um, yeah, they have a lot of areas of um, high sediment, um, high quaternary sediments, but also areas of high elevation where they put hydro projects and um, yeah, yeah, big tunnels through these areas. So it's, um, so it's a significant, yeah, yeah, significant um, setup that they have over there. Um, but it'd be, yeah, what I want to understand is, yeah, yeah, how they integrate, how they bring you know, industry in and, um, and combine that with, um, with government to get this seamless sort of working environment. So then up in Queensland, this is probably the first geotech database that um, started happening. Um, so it sort of captures a whole lot of reports. Um, we're in Sydney where um, I'm trying to break it down from reports into boreholes so um, the data is a lot more and you get to understand what's in that information rather than just relying on a report but it's progressive and it's sort of the, the registry was based on the New Zealand geotech database that came after the Christchurch event. And the reason why we need to capture this data is if you look at this sort of infrastructure pipeline and the forecasting ahead, um, like you know, 2024 is, is, is really a peak. And we need to be really, in New South Wales, we really need to be capturing this information um, because you know, in the future, if yeah, where well, you've got a peak, if you lose that information, you, know, you end up spending a lot more time and money trying to fix it up in the future. So. Um, yeah, I think we need to chase, we need to be actively sort of getting on top of things before we sort of um, peak. 
and potentially with high speed rail plan for the future, yeah, these peaks may even extend out further. So we don't know. So just the direction, um, part of the work that I, I want to go and have a look over there, but I want to sort of come back and be able to um, lobby government to um, go down the road of combining this sort of data set. Um, this, is, this is happening with the Geological Survey of New South Wales and their Coordinating Committee of Government Geologists um, with some MUAs being signed um, to allow open data transfer between the agencies. Um, this has been like, yeah, Metro West is a classic where, you know, the data that was collected, um, the investigation on that, for that, for that project there, we, you know, we saved at least about 20, $30 million worth of investigation just to have that, um, that um, data um, available. So you don't, you're still spending money on investigation because you have to, because you, you need to know groundwater regimes, you need to know, um, the, you know the aggressivity of an area, you need to know the abrasivity of an area. So um, you, you need to collect this information. Um, Standardised ground investigations um, across government departments and industry. This is being um, implemented by um, Sydney Metro and several external parties and a formalising specification guidelines to standardise the way we um, carry out investigations. Um, there's also a working party um, that's formalising um, um, the AGS format to, um, to bring it in line with other countries using AGS4. Um, so what I'd like to see all these 3D models that we produce and hence why I've sort of shown them um, is, is to allow us to capture this data, you know, because, you know, if, if I go away from these projects or who holds the data, a consultant um, or government agency, but if that government agency gets closed down, well, we lose a lot of information. And I think a lot of this data needs to go into a central repository and, you know, um, people, companies like Bentley have um, been doing work on um, um, open ground um, data using um, using um, cloud-based um, capture and this yeah, goes to a central sort of data set and yeah, I think that's, that's the way we need to look is, is trying rather than doing, putting everything on hard drives and that and losing it, I think it needs to go into, into the cloud and um, be available for everybody to use. So. so the database in the future could capture ground inf investigations uh, across the whole of New, uh, New South Wales and you know, potentially Australia. Um, um, but I think the way we have to approach this is I think there needs to be changes in the law. Um, when, we, when we put a hole in the ground, it needs to be registered because, um, you know, we, the issue is we don't know whether people drill a hole and leave a casing down there or a bit or, yeah, and if you're doing any tunnelling an area, um, this could put lives at jeopardy. Um, um, also, you know, if we can sort of maintain a consistent coordinate elevation um, and measure depth and also well completion, um, that's important, um, especially on the deeper boreholes. Um, I think that's, um, yeah, also things like um, piling. Um, tension anchors um, for, for buildings, you know, we should really understand where that, where that's defining around an area. So um, at least, yeah, when future projects go through, they, they can just assess this data and, and go from there. And I think, oh, as Churchill says, let's advance worrying, become advanced thinking and planning. So um, I thought I'd just finish that off. <laughs>